our keynote conversation will be with two very esteemed guests of ours, Ellen Ehrenprey, a partner at Auric, who is leading the starter division at her practice, who will be speaking with and interviewing Vivas Kumar, the CEO and co-founder of Mitrachem, a very innovative battery manufacturer based out of Mountain View, California. Please welcome to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. After you, Thank you. clients first. <laughs> no, you, oh yeah. mm -hmm. Well, hi everyone. We're glad to see you're all here, notwithstanding that it's hot, that it's Halloween, and that it's kind of getting late in the day, so thanks for being here with us. Um, this is such a pleasure. We're delighted to be here. Thank you to everybody here at Berkeley for inviting us and giving us the opportunity to have this conversation with you. Um, I have the great pleasure of uh, not only knowing Vivas personally, but being counsel to Mitra Chem, uh, and actually having been counsel since its formation. Um, Vivas, I thought it would be a good starting point to maybe talk a little bit about how you arrived at a decision to spend your career uh, focused in the battery materials space, um, and maybe a, a few words about Mitrochem. Yeah, sure. Um, and first, Ellen, you're a very busy person. Thanks for taking the opportunity to come and interview me. Um, only because this means I didn't have to make slides, right? I could just talk to all of you. <laughs> but no, Ellen, what Ellen is saying is true. She's known me since the foundation of this company. It was about three years ago now that Mitra Chem as a company began in earnest when I was a graduate student myself at the other university in the Bay Area. And I'm um, sorry, you know, <laughs> but I, I was sitting in the same seats as many of you are now as a graduate student. My previous career, however, had been in the space. So it wasn't that I just woke up one day and decided that I wanted to do battery materials. As a matter of fact, my you know, our family business in India, where I come from, has been a chemicals business, and it's been active for decades and decades at this point. My parents have worked in the oil and gas industry for 40 years, and I've lived all over the world due to that. And so for me, doing something in chemicals, doing something in energy, it, it was a calling. It was something that was inevitable, if you ask me, having studied engineering myself. And before I went to graduate school, I worked at Tesla at a very formative time in the company's trajectory, right? A company where Ellen has also been involved for you know, a couple of decades of her own. This is a company that has defined electrification in the transportation space, but has caused a revolution in multiple other industries. Namely, the topic for today's discussion in lithium ion batteries. So I was the senior manager for battery supply chain over there. And another one of my senior managers who I worked closely with was Max Krishner Lenhoff, who's over here, who's a senior executive at Mitrachem today. And he is a Berkeley alum, so he made the right choice in what school to go to in the Bay Area. And at the time, the Tesla Model 3 had not even come out yet. And only then was the world transitioning away from EVs being a premium product to being a mass market product. And as a result, the supply chains needed for batteries were also growing. So after having seen that tremendous growth in the time that I was there, I realized that there was an opportunity that was unfulfilled in multiple different problems that were yet to be solved in the battery supply chain. So I started Mitrochem to tackle three of those problems. The first is speed, using an in-house AI advantage to significantly reduce the design build test cycle time to bring a battery materials product from lab to market. The second is a focus on iron-rich battery materials, which are safer, they're cheaper, they originate from cleaner supply chains than your traditional Western nickel-rich solutions. And finally, it's building manufacturing scale in the USA to offset the overt geopolitical dependence that we have on assets for manufacturing in China, and which will be the prevailing topic of conversation for today to be Inflation Reduction Act compliant. Yeah, so let, let's, let's get into that a little bit. Um, you know, there are estimates that suggest that we're gonna need 300 net new mines to go online in order to meet the battery demand just in the EV space alone, uh, and a uh, 20 to 40 times increase in our current capacity of critical minerals um, to stave off a one and a half, more than a one and a half to two Celsius degree rise in global temperatures. So uh, it, clearly a hot demand for critical minerals. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act has obviously been an accelerant in creating additional demand, um, but 
there's, there's a mismatch between the acceleration of demand and the supply of critical minerals to fuel the growth that we're all hoping we can achieve to combat climate change. How, do you, how are you experiencing, as the leader uh, and CEO of an early stage startup company, uh, the impacts of the Inflation Reduction Act? What do you see as the pros and the cons for a company like yours? Well, when you throw out a stat like 300 net new mines are needed for critical minerals in the battery space, to put that into context, in the history of the Industrial Revolution, there has never been demand growth this fast in any minerals, ever. And mining as an industry is thousands and thousands of years old. It's one of the oldest industries out there. And even in the history of mining, as I went and did some research, in the early stages of my career in the critical minerals industry, I could not find another example where growth was happening this fast in the physical sciences. The growth curve for EVs looks similar to the internet, but there you were talking about digital resources, right? And it's infinitely scalable, especially now with things like Amazon Web Services. But you can't just go and infinitely scale a mine. First of all, the mine is where the mine is, and the minerals have been there for hundreds of thousands of millions of years. Right? And the second is, discoveries are not happening fast enough. And discoveries of reserves, not resources. So resources means the metal is there. Reserves mean it's economically viable to extract that material and use it at today's acceptable price point. And I think when we hear a lot of statements out there of, well, there's a ton of material in the ocean, there's a ton of material you know, in places that we've never explored before, sure, the material is there, but it may not necessarily be at the concentrations that you need. And even if you can get it at the concentrations that you need, it may not necessarily have the impurity profile that you need to be economically viable to, made, to make into the type of material that you used to make batteries, for example, but also other forms of you know, clean energy technologies. So the problem yeah. is not necessarily where do we find the mines, right? The problem is a whole of supply chain approach. And at every single step of the supply chain, new discoveries are needed, new proliferation of technologies needed, bringing down the cost curve is needed. We at Mitrochem are working on one specific part of the supply chain. So instead of a battery cell, you've got a cathode, you've got an anode. One's the plus, one's the minus. And we work on the cathodes. But in the same way that we are trying to solve the bottleneck of cathode capacity for our downstream customers, who are battery cell makers, energy storage providers, and EV makers, we too are relying on the upstream. And our upstream is an industry that moves generally very, 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 <laughs> very slowly right? Slower than the traffic I encountered to get over here. I mean, it is like a decade plus to find an economic reserve or to transform a resource into a reserve. And then you add permitting onto it. You add the fact that it's billions of dollars. You add regime change. You add technology change. You add the fear that technology is going to just wipe out the demand for the product that you're looking for. And well, on top of that, community engagement, potential interaction and consultation with tribal nations mm -hmm. that may be necessary to fuel the development of those mines. It's one of the oldest industries in mankind. It is also one of the hardest industries in mankind to tackle, the upstream supply chain for critical minerals. And I really applaud the people who are going out and doing the good work, of which the current iteration of Mitrochem will be a beneficiary. Yeah, so um, given where we are, uh, in trying to solve for our current supply chain problems. Um, the, the White House recently launched the American Battery Materials Initiative. It really stemmed from three objectives that the government has, the expansion of sustainable and environmentally uh, responsible mining um, and availability of uh, recycling critical minerals, the creation of partner alliances that may create more opportunity for international supply chain uh, opportunity, and then the development of a faster and, as you were just mentioning, and more efficient uh, permitting process for mines. How do you gauge where we are and the government uh, and the actions the government has taken so far to meet those objectives? What do you think the holes are? Mm. And where could we be doing better? You need three things, three things from the government to effectively kickstart this industry. Legislation, policy, and funding. 
for the first time in this industry, we have a combination of all three. So Ellen, what you gave was a great example of policy. Legislation, Inflation Reduction Act is a great example. Funding, bipartisan infrastructure law, which has put aside billions of dollars of grants for critical minerals buildup and for downstream critical minerals buildup. This is the most comprehensive government effort we have seen to tackle this specific issue. If and when the United States succeeds on this, it will be on the league of some of the other huge infrastructure buildup we've had in this country, like the space race, the national highway system, building the internet, building global GPS. That is the level of consequential nature that we're talking about over here. However, if you ask me, it is still not happening fast enough. Why? Because once again, we're talking about a mismatch where the downstream EVs are growing at 25 to 30% per year in terms of consumption. Every single electric vehicle that comes off an assembly line has a buyer today. Every single one. Even if you doubled output, there would still be a buyer and there'd still be demand. The upstream is just not keeping up, but it's not their fault. So what can be done to go faster other than the policy and the legislation and the funding? Well, more policy, less legislation, and more funding. <laughs> But the funding needs to be dispersed faster. So this is the other issue. In order for government-related financing to be consequential for the upstream supply chain, there are so many hurdles that one has to jump through right, at the federal level. And if you compare that to other countries where resources are the lifeblood of the country, everything gets put aside to get resources projects up and running. So what the Inflation Reduction Act tried to do was to create a walled garden around the United States and around some of the ally nations with whom the United States has a free trade agreement right now to jumpstart the domestic industry growth by creating more addressable demand that cannot get supply sources that exist today, namely from China. The demand is there, though. We're solving the wrong problem. If we keep trying to incentivize demand, there's nothing more that we can do. We need to incentivize more supply. And I think you hit it spot on, Ellen. Yeah. Well, and there's a natural tension to some extent between the focus of the Inflation Reduction Act on the U.S. and its free trade partners and our more historical approach to multinationalism and that tension is going, to, there's going to have to be a break, right? Because in order for us to solve the supply side, we have to figure out where we're going to be able to source these critical minerals to be able to fuel and continue the growth that we clearly need to drive mm -hmm. to transition us away from traditional fossil fuels. Yep. Right? I mean, that just has to be a priority. How are you, um, you know, as you think about where you are today, uh, you know, leading a young startup company, uh, and where you were when you were at Tesla, working at a you know very different global company, um, what are the differences in how you think about for someone you know in your position today versus someone uh, you know at a, a global company? What are the um, opportunities that the Inflation Reduction Act either affords or doesn't afford in those p two different positions? Right, really different. It looks really different depending on where you are in the value chain. Well, let me, let me correct one misconception over here. Tesla at the time was an absolute nobody, right? Well, give, I give, know that credit, <laughs> give, give credit to Elon. Like what yeah. they've done is amazing and, and the rest of the team as well. Back in 2016, we were going and chasing suppliers to try to get them to build capacity for us. They just had no interest. I mean, they had well-established customers that had been buying from them for decades specialty chemicals products that were applicable to markets outside of electric vehicles. And what they saw was this crazy guy in California, right, promising this big vision. And chemicals, conserv chemicals companies are very conservative, right? Mining companies are very conservative. They're not going to bet on the new technology trend that easily. Versus now, the suppliers are going to Tesla and begging them for business, right? So that shift took many, many years to happen. And personally, when it comes to being an entrepreneur, the battery materials knowledge is fine, but it's actually the grit and the hustle that matters in terms of getting the company up and running. 
And really, what I'm doing now is not that different than what the job was in the very beginning of my time in the battery materials industry, where I had to just go convince a lot of people to take a bet on Tesla at the time, right? And now I get to point to that as a success story, as a reason for why people should be betting on companies like mine, all the way up and down the battery supply chain. And even then, right, if you put yourself in the shoes of chemicals companies or mining companies, in their minds, startups come and go, you can get acquired tomorrow, right? You could merge with another company tomorrow. You may not be here in this company tomorrow, but the brand that is this mining company, this chemicals company that has existed for 120 years, this mining asset that has existed and has had 20 presidents of the country where they operate in the time in which the company is operated, right? They just feel like they're gonna outlast you no matter what. And so you have to incentivize them to come to you. So how do you do that? So the way that you do that and things like Inflation Reduction Act really, really help, is there is nobody who can incentivize industrialization like governments. And number one in that is the United States government, which is why it was so consequential and so landmark that BIL and IRA and so many executive orders around mineral security partnership, critical minerals alliance between US and Japan, all of this has happened just within the last three years. This is more action on critical and, and potentially, minerals. And potentially new partnerships coming online, but EU, UK. But yeah, I mean, we're currently negotiating free trade agreements yeah. for critical minerals with the EU and the UK. There's you know, an MSP with the US and India right now. This multilateral approach at this level and pace, which is comparable to what was done for NATO, is happening on critical minerals. This is really cool. It makes my life easier, because I don't have to explain the trend as much. Right? If the U.S. government is willing to stand behind the trend and willing to say, we're going to put our credibility, we're going to put our national security apparatus behind this, we're going to put our funding behind this to the Department of Energy, we're going to appropriate funding, which, by the way, began with the Republican president, has been strengthened with the Democratic president, and will probably continue the test of time, no matter what the 2024 election says. That's amazing. It's never been a better time to do work in that's critical an, minerals. That's a good and optimistic prognostication. I like that. But it has never been more important to do work in critical minerals as well. You know why? We cannot mess this up now. If there is this much government support and we do not deliver on the promise that is made on the support, we will set the cause of electrification and climate back by decades. So this is the burden that I bear as an entrepreneur in this space that a lot of my peers bear in this space, right? It's not just about get the best battery material out there. It is, this is a generational problem. It's finally getting the attention that it deserves from the highest levels of governance in the world. We cannot mess this up. So given where we are and given where we need to, to go in order to solve the supply side to meet the increasing demand, what are the, what are the places where we can double down you know, can you talk about replacement technology? Are there uh, uh, recycling technology? Where do you think this is going in terms of traje trajectory to help solve? Right now, we don't have enough free trade partners and we don't have enough capacity. And we're many, many com companies are constrained, you know, here in the US, being able to actually fuel that growth. Where is it gonna come from? In the same way that we talk about how mining discoveries take a very long time, Technologies that use critical minerals also take a very long time to reach a high level of readiness. So if you take the lithium ion battery, the first battery research in the way of thinking about lithium ion batteries was done in the 1950s. The Nobel Prize work on lithium ion batteries was done in the 1970s. The first lithium ion battery commercialization happened in 1991 with the Sony Walkman. Uh, who owned a Sony Walkman here? Yeah. Definitely, you were super cool if you owned a Sony Walkman, <laughs> right? And the first electric vehicles with lithium ion batteries happened in 2003. And here we are today, lithium ion batteries have reached a level of maturity to where you're not gonna get blank stares if you talk about betting behind lithium ion batteries as the platform technology for energy storage. So for some other technology to come and just suddenly replace lithium ions, it's gonna to have to go through a similar learning curve as lithium ion batteries have gone through. It doesn't have to be 70 years, right? Like the, the pace of technology growth is such that we want those cycles to shorten and shorten, but we're not seeing anything that's just gonna come through and crush lithium ion batteries as the platform technology for energy storage in the short term. There are other manifestations of batteries 
as energy storage platforms, right? You can always argue about solid state versus conventional lithium ion. You can argue about, you know, graphite anode versus silicon anode. But these are all tiny problems as compared to the major problem of how do you feed the tremendous demand for critical minerals for lithium ion batteries as they are today, which are going to be hard to replace. Okay, so let's just establish that as a basis. We need to live with the lithium ion batteries. So now let's take a more optimistic view, Ellen. Right? How do you actually solve this problem? Multilateralism with free trade agreement countries, which the United States has done very well. Right? We, we have a tremendous track record of multilateralism. Let's keep doing this. IRA well, is a great example. Well, what's happened in the wake of the IRA is a great example, mm -hmm. right? Because it's, it's forcing, it's really been a forcing function to maintain that uh, preservation of multilateralism so that we can actually achieve where we need to go. Completely agree. Yeah, although the, conceptually, I think there was a, a, a really a home focus. But conceptually, there was a home focus, but if you look at, if you pattern recognize what the United States has done in national security and in energy, we have never been autarkic. We've always had partners that we've relied on, yeah. and we will have partners that we rely on. This is a good thing, yeah. right? Having partners that we rely on. You talked about recycling, right, as one way to solve the problem. Recycling is not only a solution that the United States is looking at. We are well endowed by having lots of critical minerals here in the US. Resources, not always reserves, but resources. There are plenty of countries out there with large, booming populations that want clean energy, that have no resources indigenously. The best example of this is the country where I was born, India. The most populous country in the world that has absolutely no reserves of lithium, of nickel, of cobalt, of aluminum, of manganese. I just named five of the 50 critical minerals and I could just keep going on and on in this list. So for those countries that lack these in-house or in-country reserves, for them, recycling is the solution. If the battery cell, if the battery pack comes into our land, let's hold on to it here. Let's recycle it here. The issue with recycling, right? I'm not saying it won't be solved, but it's just something to keep in mind, is you are running up against the incentives that a battery cell maker has on their technology roadmap. When you buy a Tesla today, you want that battery to last, last a long time, forever, right? Yep. And I envision a future in which when you buy the electric vehicle, you are holding on to the battery pack as the most valuable part of the vehicle for 20, 30 years, and you're replacing the car body every 10 years to keep up with whatever is new. That's diametrically opposed to having a large input feedstock of battery cells coming in for recycling. Right? So that's just an issue that recyclers have to contend with. And the second issue that we need to think about is even when a battery reaches end of life, it doesn't mean the battery is just dead. It just means that it's no longer fit for the purpose, for the application in which it was first made. So what we see happening in China, which is the global leader in many parts of battery supply chain, including in recycling, is the downcycling market is really taking off. So battery cells, battery packs that were used for automotive functions are then being used at the end of their life for energy storage, once they're done in that energy storage function, they're going to an even longer duration storage. I mean, this is exactly the right thing to do, is to amortize the carbon cost needed to manufacture that battery cell over as long a life as possible. We're gonna see that trend continuing. So given that, where do you see things going for those parts of the, of the world, developing nations that have this critical need and can't get capacity? Where do you see the conversation going around the fairness of that. We also see right now, this is where multilateralism comes in, right? So defense pacts are usually where multilateralism first begins. And I'll just take the example of India again, right? Because I brought up that they don't have indigenous resources over here. They didn't have indigenous resources for oil instead, but they did a great job of multilateralism in terms of building their own energy security in-house, right? And now the world's most efficient petrochemical refinery, the world's most efficient is in India. And they have been able to keep up their multilateral relationships for oil in the 75 years that that country has existed. Likewise, in terms of defense, the United States and India are working very closely together on this whole concept of the Quad, which is a Indo-Pacific strategy, mostly around containing China. 
And what that means is it's going to be the start of many such partnerships that India will have with other countries that are very resource rich, right? Australia is a good example. Canada is a good example. The United States is a good example, all of which are thinking about defense partnerships with India. Outside of India, if you think about Southeast Asia, for example, they're doing the opposite, right? Southeast Asia is thinking, so Vietnam, Philippines, Thailand, Singapore, these are also countries that may not necessarily have the resources and reserves, but they're looking more to China as being the country with whom they can strengthen their trading ties so that they can have access to clean energy technologies. So the interception of the U.S. multilateral approach and the desire for populations to uplift themselves out of poverty by taking advantage of the relentless march of energy costs to zero dollars over time and by having access to the clean supply chains, it doesn't always map cleanly. China will be a force in this, and there will be certain countries that align their multilateral approaches towards China and not towards the United States. It's the reality of the world in which we live. We are better placed by recognizing it now. We are also better placed, by the way, by recognizing, once again, Chinese companies are the best companies in the battery supply chain. We can learn a lot from those companies. Yeah, so thinking about that and taking it one step further, um, thinking about you know, what the world is going to look like. There are lots of factors that play into risk assessment. As a company is thinking about how to source, they have to think about risk mit mitigation and how to you know, have downside planning scenarios. Uh, you know, that could be geopolitical. It could be you know, here, a uh, change of uh, administration. There could be lots of things that impact what the landscape looks like. How, do you, how, do, how should companies think about weighing cost of resources, risk mitigation, and what the strategy should be. I'll give you an, an ugly example of this that recently played out, is the Russia-Ukraine war. So Russia is the world's lowest cost producer and one of the largest producers of nickel. When sanctions began 20 months ago now, the London Metal Exchange price of nickel went all over the place. And Western buyers of nickel, especially those that were looking at nickel, for battery cell supply chain had a really hard time, which hastened their move towards lithium iron phosphate, lithium manganese iron phosphate, being an iron rich cathode company, it's good for me, <laughs> right? But now what we see happening is the situation for nickel has gotten so desperate that you do have Western trading firms trying to circumvent the sanctions using an army of lobbyists and lawyers to try to get their hands on Russian nickel, Russian aluminum, because it is the lowest cost, the best assets in the world. This has always been the problem with mining. In every other economic resource since the beginning of time, you can move those resources at a certain cost. The mine is where the mine is. It's been there since before you were born. It's going to be there for decades and decades and millennia. You have to work with whatever jurisdiction is overseeing that mine. And a lot of times you just don't have a choice. Like it is, it is very easy to sit here and pontificate on we should never touch Russian nickel, right? Now, of course, being iron rich, I just stray away from that debate completely. But there's many companies out there where if they do not have access to those resources, that company will fail. That company will fail. All the suppliers that depend on that company will fail. All the people who depend on jobs of that company will be out of a job. It is a very difficult decision to make. And so these complex geopolitics and the complex changes of geopolitics that seem to happen in many resource-rich countries, it's just something that we have to contend with, especially when we think about critical minerals. This is something that IRA was trying to go after also, right? Which is, let's just remove the complex critical minerals geopolitical question by trying to do as much of this in the United States as possible. I'll tell you what else, Ellen. We have a great example of this successfully working, fracking in oil and gas. We are no longer dependent on oil and gas from foreign adversarial nations, right? It took 25 years of work on fracking to get there, but it was a combination of policy, legislation, and funding, and frankly, a couple of hot wars that sparked that to happen. So if you give a long enough time span, the desire for the United States to be critical minerals independent or to take a multilateral approach towards critical minerals is definitely possible. But the time span is a lot longer than some people like. Yeah, well, there's, there are so many facets of making that process more expedient, right? Getting new mines on, online is an enormously complicated mm -hmm. 
uh, process laden with regulatory, legislative, compliance issues, uh, you know, so many factors, lots and lots of factors within communities, environmental factors. There's, you know, a whole host of laws that have to be complied with, uh, you know, even to just get into the permitting process. So it, it's going to be a long time, I think. And unfortunately, given where we are in Washington, I don't know how uh, facile our legislators are going to be with coming up with solutions that are fast enough to meet where we our need. Absolutely. I mean, look, we're sitting here in Silicon Valley. We're dreaming the future. We're inventing new technologies. We're bringing these technologies out to market. But the real game for critical minerals is played in Washington. Yeah. I think there's never been a more consequential election for climate and for critical minerals than 2024. Because the question that everybody has on their minds, those who are industry insiders and those who are observing from afar the Inflation Reduction Act with skepticism, right, is, is this law, is the policy, the legislation, and the funding going to survive yeah. whatever might happen in the 2024 election, right? Regardless of whomever is the person that wins the presidency, it's a question of where will the Congress go, you know, and where will that be in conjunction with the president, and what will the messaging around Inflation Reduction Act be? So I'll give you another example of this myself, right? I, I, I've had a great time in Washington, D.C., um, speaking with senators, speaking with Congress people, speaking with DOE staffers. In general, there's broad alignment that we need these programs for critical minerals to last no matter what the political wind should be. Because on one hand, it's energy independence, which both sides can get behind. On the other hand, it's job creation, which both sides can get behind. I mean, this is one of those rare things, and the thing that nobody else will tell you, but if you ask them enough, they will tell you. It's US strategic positioning against China, which both parties can really get behind. This is the thesis. Let's see if it's true, right? No, no matter who wins in 2024 for presidency or, or Congress, let's see what the continuity of this bill is because the entire industry hinges on the continuity of this bill. The critical minerals industry, the electrification thesis, hinges on the continuity of the policy, legislation, and funding from the last five years. Yeah. I mean, the auto industry alone is putting tremendous pressure on, uh, on our legislature. Uh, they want to make sure that they get the benefit of the tax credits under the IRA. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and for that, they are imposing requirements on their downstream suppliers to make sure that those credits are going to be available and they can pass them along. Yeah. Um, and so that, that's... It's all very publicly known that General Motors led our Series B, um, which is something that both Ellen and I worked on together. And every single call I have with General Motors is about the Inflation Reduction Act. Yeah. Right? It's always, what can we do for you? in terms of bringing IRA-compliant materials to your supply chain. I know this is the same conversation they're having with every one of their suppliers. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not just GM. It's, it's everyone, every car manufacturer. Absolutely right. Yeah. So I know we're over time, but I thought maybe we could open it up for some questions and see if sure. folks have uh, questions. I don't, and let us know. I don't know whoever is, uh, is running the show. Let us know if we uh, are out of time. But if there's still a few minutes, we're happy to open up for questions. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, so my name is Arno. I'm second year MBA and uh, Burke co-president. Um, so I understand there are a lot of like new battery technologies emerging right now. Uh, yours, uh, iron base. There is also lithium metal, uh, sodium ion. Do you think at the end of the race, this technology race, there will be one winner mm -hmm. with the best technology and all the other companies like losing the game? Or there will be a mix of good technologies, each of them sharing, uh, having a market share. Mm. I use the words platform technology to describe lithium ion batteries. Platform technology is one on which multiple different product categories for multiple different customer segments are built. So for example, what you use in a mass market EV may not be necessarily what you use in long duration energy storage. What you use for medium duty trucking may not necessarily be what you use for long distance trucking. What you use for a US mass market customer who wants as long a range as possible may not be what you use for a Chinese mass market customer who doesn't care about range but cares a lot more about cost, right? It may not be the same as what you use in India where somebody cares a lot more about operating temperature conditions rather than any of the other factors that I just mentioned, right? Also cost. Where I'm going with this is multiple different technologies, multiple different companies, multiple different products are needed for all these different segments to electrify. It's actually a good thing when we see people coming out with 
competing and complementary technologies to a company like mine. I mean, we really applaud this. So we mentioned, you know, General Motors led our last round. Very publicly, General Motors has also led the rounds of other companies in the battery supply chain using other complementary technologies. Because in their minds, right, they've never confirmed this publicly, but they're taking a whole of supply chain strategy. And if they're looking at batteries as a platform technology, right, of course you want every single part of the battery to be improving. So when I think about batteries 30 years from now, I think about semiconductors as they are today. It's not like there's one company that's won everything. Right? I think TSMC has emerged as the best fab. NVIDIA has quickly emerged as the best designer for GPUs and advanced chips. But there's plenty of other companies that are doing very well in the semiconductor space, right, in the broader ecosystem. Likewise, if we think about batteries today, right, there are certain companies that have emerged as the best battery cell players. There are certain companies that have emerged as the best players in the upstream supply chain for specific parts of the battery as of today. But we're still at the beginning. Let's see where we are in 30 years. Thank you. Yep. And I'll, I'll stick around also. So Max um, will also join me up over here, and he'll also be happy to answer any questions as a fellow answer. Berkeley alum as well. Maybe say who he is. Yeah. Um, I, I mentioned Max earlier. Max, why don't you just come and join us here, because we're going to end pretty soon. Max is our head of commercial, uh, and he's a Berkeley Haas alum as well. So you know, after this last question, Max and I will stand off to the side of the stage, and we're happy to stay as long as you want and answer any questions. Do you have a question? Thank you so much, Vivas. I have a question, and also um, just want to clarify that Thailand is neither is not relying on um, China, it relying on India as well. <laughs> and having said this, I know that you've touched upon a lot of the macroeconomics of how um, battery is the future, and how you know, as an investor from Thailand, we are actually looking towards America. We're looking in this direction. Just want to make it clear because not only the model is correct, but the, the fact that Americans are looking into investing in this in order to create jobs. That is, that is one of the, um, that is an authentic thesis uh, towards ESG. I know that ESG in the boardrooms now is for financial reasons, but I think America has been from the start before ESG was a cool thing. America is uh, uh, kind of the, the, the what you call it, the, the model for, for a lot of the investors and a lot of other countries. I want to touch upon and ask about the microeconomics of your technology. I know that um, you are using machine learning and AI to, to help out with some of these products and how are your products different from, from other miners or other suppliers of, of cathodes? Thank yeah, you. sure. Thank you. So, by the way, thank you for those nice comments. We take product from mining companies, especially chemicals companies, and we make a performance chemical on it. When we think about our product portfolio and we think about what we want to do for future products, it needs to intersect with a few themes. It needs to deliver better energy density at the same or lower cost without compromising on other customer specs. We need to be able to get to that product faster through R&D cycles in-house and accomplish that product using two constraining variables. Number one, does it scale with existing manufacturing process technology with minimal customization so that we can do rapid scale up? Doing something in a lab is easy. Doing something at tens of thousands of tons per year scale is very, very hard. And there's only so many risks we can take as a startup. We are firmly taking product development risk. Today, we are not taking process scale up risk. Right? We are taking product scale up risk, but not process scale up risk. Number two, does it come from existing supply chains that are already scalable and can already be scaled in Inflation Reduction Act compliant manner? What we don't want to do is go work with more critical minerals that are even more esoteric, that are even more hard to find, and even less viable for the Inflation Reduction Act. So when we think about constraining our product development along those lines, it actually makes it extremely clear what we need to do. This is why we only have three products today. Right, LFP, well-known, well-industrialized, LMFP, which has been publicly stated as a main target for GM to accomplish with us, and what we call LMX, which is a very high-energy-dense, iron-rich cathode, which will have comparable performance to nickel-rich at the battery pack level. Those commercial, you know, those consequential commercial decisions as constraining factors around product development is just a very different approach than you would see in a normal R&D company. And we do this because we come from a heritage of thinking commercially, Right? And we want the products to be built at scale into vehicles on American roads and on roads in the West as quickly as possible. This is what is needed to fight climate change. Right? We just need to get products out as quickly as possible. 
I'm going well, to uh, keep my next comment very um, short, uh, just 10 seconds. Um, I think that China is leading um, some of these mining industries because they have never been so concerned with ESG, but because America has always been um, true to their um, true to their uh, uh, um, priorities the, with the ESG. That's why mining industry did not take off. However, with you, uh, Vivas, and also the AI technology, maybe in the next decade, America can bridge that gap. So, um, a lot of high hopes for you. Thank you. Yep. We're That's one of great. many companies that will go and solve this problem. And I hope that I'll be back in 10 years and I'll be talking about what the next 10 years of AI-enabled decarbonization materials for climate change will look like. Wonderful. So thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Yeah, thank you all very much. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Great job, Lewis. Thank you. Great job.